The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Depending on where you're logging in from today, one of those will sound just about right. Uh, welcome back to another great episode of our Best Practices webinar series with 7Signal. I see several of you have joined early today. As always, thank you for doing that. Um, if you'd like to, go ahead and drop in the questions panel where you're joining from today. Um, if you are working remotely from home, if you're in the office, what part of the world you're from, we would love to hear from you. Um, I myself am working remotely from my apartment in downtown Cleveland today where we just received a couple inches of snow in late April. So a great start to the spring in my opinion. Um, we are also joined by very special guest Lee Badman today. How are you today, Lee? I'm doing well, Kelsey, thanks. Awesome, thanks for being here. And we're also joined as always by Jim Vada in Cincinnati. How are you today, Jim? Yeah, I'm good too. Thanks, Kelsey. We got a little bit of that snow down here as well, which is uncommon in this area. So, exactly. but I think we're headed for 70 degrees tomorrow. So it's sort of that Colorado style weather. Exactly. We'll swing back quickly there um, and on our way mm -hmm. to spring. All right, awesome. I see a lot of you dropping in here today. We have Germund joining us from Norway. Thank you, Germund, for being here again. We have Pola joining us from Denver, Colorado. Thank you, Pola. We have Lex joining us from Dallas, Texas. And let's see who else have we have here. Jeff joining us from Galleon, Ohio. Um, and we have Anders joining us from Northern Sweden. And they just got four inches of snow this weekend. All right. Thank you, Anders. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. And if you want to keep dropping in during the um, broadcast, you can go ahead and do so. But we are 7 Signal, the leader in wireless experience monitoring. And before we pass it off to Lee, we will give a little background on 7 Signal and what our mission is. So we have a great topic here today, thinking about a wireless RFP, how to glean true cost of ownership. And as I mentioned, we are joined by Lee Badman today and Jim Vada. And um, as always, I'm Kelsey Rizzuto, the marketing specialist here at 7Signal. Really excited to dive into this topic here today. And if you have any questions at all for Lee or Jim, drop them in the questions panel throughout today's presentation and we can cover them during Q&A. All right, a couple of announcements here before we begin. Congratulations to our newest Seven Signal certified wireless engineers. We have a pretty long list this week, and so I'll go ahead and read those off. Apologies in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. But congratulations to Metha Shiwana Chakran, Rahil Iqbal, Lambros Kastaris, Viseos Kastaris, Eleni Katsani, and David Kapanadzi. Um, so congratulations to you all. Um, huge congratulations from everyone here at 7Signal. Uh, as a reminder here, we also partner with CWNP for every single one of our webinars. So by attending these weekly webinars, you are eligible for continued learning credits. So if you're pursuing a certification and are in need of those, um, just go ahead and drop us a message and we can easily send you over a PDF certificate. We also host a product tour every single Friday, um, and you can go ahead and register at that link there, go.7signal.com slash tour, and um, get all the updates that are going on with Mobileye and Sapphire Eye. So we'll go ahead and drop that registration link here in the chat as well. We also post all of our slides and recordings to our Twitter account after the broadcast. So if you're on there, go ahead and give us a follow at 7Signal. But if you're not, no worries. All of you should be receiving a follow-up email with the recording of today's broadcast and the PowerPoint slides as well. And with no. that, we also post all of our archived webinars to our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in watching any of the previous topics that we've covered, you can go ahead and look us up there as well. 
Okay, a little background on Seven Signal. We were established in 2007 in Helsinki, Finland, and we're now located in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, really proud of the milestones that we've hit along the way, such as the 1 billion data points that we're analyzing daily, in addition to the 5 million devices that we're monitoring daily as well. And with that, we also have 15 patents, which goes to show that the technology you see from us at Seven Signal, you're only going to see from us at Seven Signal. So to give you a little background as to what makes us so different, if you look at your typical enterprise LAN infrastructure here, you've got great tools, great technologies already installed on the network, such as your Riverbed, Cisco, Aruba, AppNeta, and more, that are giving you really useful feedback, really useful perspective into the infrastructure of the network. But we pick up where they leave off living in a different space um, from the edge of the network outside looking in. And we'll start here first with Mobileye. Mobileye gives you full visibility into the user experience and can be installed on the individual devices themselves as a software agent, such as your laptops, your mobile phones, your pickers and scanners, um, tablets, a workstation on wheels if you're in the healthcare space, um, and more, giving you that perspective from the user's digital experience. And in addition to that, we can also get that perspective into those external home networks. Um, for example, a lot of us here are working remotely and have been for quite a while and will continue to do so. So having that perspective into your devices that you're using from home um, is incredibly crucial to stay connected and productive with your work as well. And we also have Sapphire Eye, which are the sensors for service level quality and RF visibility. And through this combination, you're really gaining a full holistic perspective as to what's occurring in your network that you just can't find anywhere else. All right, thanks for letting me run through our history here at Seven Signal. Before we pass it over to Lee, we are gonna launch one trivia question today. So let's see how you all do. All right, Lee and Jim, can you see this question? Uh, yep. Okay. I know what answer I would pick. <laughs> <laughs> RFP stands for Really Flawed Process Radio Fingerprint or Request for Proposal. And I see a lot of you dropping your answers in here. We will go ahead and close this out. All right, guys, how did we do? Well, I might argue that there's two right answers there, but... Uh... The crowd, uh, the, the majority did uh, technically get it all right there, but really flawed process. Eh. <laughs> Hopefully that's what we're going to avoid uh, after today's discussion, but RFP is request for proposal. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you to all of you for answering that trivia question. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass the controls over to Lee. And as he gets set up, I'll pass it to Jim to give a little introduction to our guest and today's discussion. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. So we're really happy to have Lee Badman join us again today. He is a wireless network architect in higher education and a frequent blogger, uh, uh, a frequent um, tweeter on tw on Twitter, and a CWNE. So welcome, Lee. Are you ready to go? I believe so. All right, let's, take it away. Let's, thanks. Let's do it. All right, thanks, Jim and Kelsey. And nice to be here in front of everybody listening and watching, et cetera. Um, I can make my controls work. So this is one of those non-technical topics um, that, you know, depending on what side of the table you sit on, whether you're an end user, customer, vendor, integrator, whatever, um, means different things to you. I am approaching this discussion as somebody who has needed to buy um, wireless systems you know multiple times through the years I am sympathetic to those who sell them I do my own stuff on the side some consulting so I dabble in in that side of life on occasion um, you know so I get the desire to you know make a lot of money and sell a lot of stuff but for me this discussion is you know really, uh, coming from the perspective of, you know, I, I have big networks that I need to refresh and upgrade and, um, you know, evolve and all of that. So, you know, frame of reference is everything. You might have a, somebody who's selling product that would give a totally dif different uh, discussion, but just to let you know where I'm coming from with, the, with what you're about to hear. 
So, yeah, I'm, I'm me, I've been around, I'm getting old. That's all we need to say. So, and again, um, you know, get into why the whole notion of total cost of ownership is worth discussing. It's one of those non-technical things that, you know, it's almost like for anybody who, you know, watched Seinfeld, um, you know, the one where uh, they were talking about risk management, one of the most boring topics. <laughs> Why don't you explain risk management to me? You know, it's like, it's not fun to think about. It's not exciting. We all get jazzed about, you know, speeds and, you know, radio stuff and, you know, tech, more tech focused things. But unfortunately, if you're in the business of buying and procuring and, and all of that and managing budgets, you, you have to be cognizant of what we're about to discuss. I have found through the years, again, I've been doing this for a while, that the true uh, quote unquote price of a wireless network can be really nebulous. You know, there's what you pay up front, but you're, you're not done. Um, you know, over the life cycle of the, uh, you know, system, you know, there may be a lot of surprises. You might find that you tried to get something that's all encompassing. And then a lot of the, you know, that's the, the notion of the super system. Um, and then, you know, you, you didn't get what was promised. So you have to go out and replace bits and pieces with other bits and pieces and it starts to add up. One of my personal hot buttons is the notion of uh, fluffy bundles of crap. Um, everybody's a software company now, so all kinds of stuff to wade through there. You want X, Y, and Z, but you have to buy half of the alphabet just to get X, Y, and Z because that's the way it's bundled and you know, you're getting value rammed down your throat whether you want it or not. And you know, sometimes you can negotiate some of that away, sometimes you can't, but you know, We'll talk about all of this um, as we go, especially the uh, emotions part is to me um, really worth thinking about as we get into the notion of uh, TCO and RFPs and such. So hopefully, you know, we're getting a footing about, you know, why I wanted to, to go down this path as a discussion uh, topic. So again, this is a side note. And, you know, again, I'm coming at it from the perspective of the customer and if you're on the vendor side and you're you know kind of heinous maybe you look at this and say yeah I, I try to leverage that and you know I want the RF or I want the TCO to be higher because I'm making money but you know what, whatever um, from the customer side you know these emotions and I won't read them all because you guys are per perfectly capable of reading I'm sure um, the one thing I will uh, talk about though specifically is the notion of surrender you know, RFPs can be pretty stressful. The bigger your environment, the more money is about to get spent. You're charged with, uh, if not authorizing the expenditure of that money, you're certainly charged with proposing the expenditure of, you know, sometimes, you know, seven figures, depending on how big you are when it's time to do all of this stuff. And there's a lot riding on it. You know, your personal reputation, um, organizational reputation when the people start when people start using that which you've recommended to be uh, bought and a lot of people just don't handle the process very well so they go right to the notion of surrender i've always been with vendor x they're telling me i need to do this i'll just let them you know tell me what comes next and uh, i i think that's not particularly smart um I think that can bite you. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but uh, for where we are in the discussion, the bottom bolded uh, text, I think is pretty important. When it's time to do the RFP, you know, you gotta keep your wits. You gotta zoom way out, get a big view. And it's your requirements that count way more than anything a vendor might wanna tell you that you need. Um, I can't tell you how many times, like on the notion of guest solutions, I've had different vendors well, this is how we do it. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Well, this is what you should be getting. Those aren't my requirements. This is how we do it. Um, are you hearing me? <laughs> it's not working. This conversation is broken. Um, I'm trying to tell you my requirements. And you know, you, you've got to be faithful to those requirements because if you lose sight of what you're trying to accomplish, um, trying to get back 
to that focus later on after you've spent the money and realize you've made some mistakes it all adds up to you know you're, you're taking dollars away from something else and therefore tco goes up and again you know all of us are in this together um you know not to repeat everything that already got said but um, the larger you are, the higher the stakes, a lot of big dollars going on here. Um, one thing I found to be kind of interesting, the middle bullet there, your frame of reference, maybe dated. You know, if you haven't bought a system in quite a while, you know, three, five, eight years, whatever, you might find that your expectations for what makes up a wireless system and what is a, you know, that which you're envisioning wanting to buy may not even exist anymore. You might get back RFP responses that, you know, we don't do it that way anymore. Things have changed, you know, little nuanced things like, you know, with so much moving off to the cloud and, um, you know, you have to be ready for, to admit that, okay, maybe I'm kind of dated here and I got to get some education based on these um, responses so I can make good decisions on on how to, go forward and that generates stress and all of that. Um, doesn't matter how much effort you put into it. I have found that you can take a lot of smart people, write up an RFP, have everybody peer review, um, get outside input, you know, go to other organizations that, you know, where you have people that you trust and put a lot of eyes on it. And you still end up leaving out important stuff. And that's just kind of part of being human and all of that. But do it once or twice, and the next time you have it, you start feeling the stress of, oh God, I don't want to make the same mistakes I made last time again, or I heard that so-and-so, you know, um, forgot to do blah, 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 and that really bit them, and, and all of that adds up to, to stress. And if you're not doing just wireless, but you're doing wireless and switches and radius, each silo, for lack of a better uh, term, you know, how network deep is this? How many little rabbit holes are you going down? And the more of those that you're um, going down, the more stressful it gets trying to get it all right. So what makes up TCO to me? You've got the obvious costs, right? You've got the things that are easy to predict, the upfront pricing, you know, parts, labor, uh, routine maintenance and all of that. And then you've got you know, what I'm calling hidden costs. And, you know, that's where I'll spend a little bit of time. And you can just read the other bullets, but um, the notion of hidden costs. One thing that I have uh, found is if you buy almost any wireless vendor, and I'm not looking to, um, you know, throw dirt on uh, different vendors, but I guess like I can't help but do that a little bit. Um, anything that you get into too early, like it's a brand new product line. It's uh, it's only been out a year. It's only been out a year and a half, whatever, um, some magic time frame, and maybe that varies vendor to vendor. Doesn't matter how glossy the advertising is, doesn't matter how great the presentations are when the sales folk come in, you're buying beta product. And when you're buying beta product, you have to be mindful of, okay, this is all very sexy and new, and it's the latest and greatest, but I'd better probably earmark a thousand man hours of debugging and a you know some quantity of uh, time for all of the non-routine administrative tasks that are going to come because this is bleeding edge and most of the vendors have a culture that allows bugs out the door and crowdsource QA. I mean that's just the industry that I feel like I'm living in. Um, a lot of it comes out and it's not ready for prime time or a lot of features can't be turned on until two releases down the road and then once those releases come out they need some tuning and you're doing a lot of upgrades and all of that so to me all of that kind of comes down to hidden costs and that you know are you buying mature and proven or are you buying cutting edge and cutting edge to me comes with a fair amount of hidden costs and, you know hopefully now they're not so hidden I'm, I'm calling them out into the light of day <clears throat> so on the topic let's break down the last slide a little bit on the topic of the obvious costs you know usually what we're asking for in an rfp and hopefully you've got your requirements right 
you know, we need X number of APs, you know, external antennas, decisions on the architecture and licensing, and you know, if there's new cabling involved, et cetera. <clears throat> Again, things that are easily quantified. These are these are things that you can throw dollars at and say, yep, it's a unit cost, and that's easily that's easily arrived at. Or is it? So hopefully the stuff that you are saying is easily quantified. Hopefully you're doing due diligence on at least thinking about your design. If you're still rocking that 802.11b cable plant and you're looking at doing 11ax, you, you may not you know, be working under what I would call solid design. Um, sooner or later it needs to change. I mean, I will freely admit that I have uh, places where Basically, the cabling plant and the AP density is so generous that, you know, any place we need an AP to be or to move or to be removed or whatever, um, thankfully, we've got a good robust cabling plant. And then we've got other spaces where, um, you know, good God, I would not go to, you know, newer stuff without resurveying that and possibly recabling. You know? So, again, you never escape design. And even if you don't feel like you need to do a complete design on all, you know, 200 of your buildings or all 500 of your sites or whatever, you do need to at least do some soul searching on, are there parts of the environment that need to be, um, you know, looked at in that regard? Again, otherwise you're gonna come back and be doing rework and that's gonna drive up your TCO. Talk about the hidden, the notion of uh, hidden costs. I kind of introduced that a couple of slides back, but you know, this is where you put out the RFP, you made your choices, you bought your stuff, and now you got to live with it, right? We already talked about the uh, the bundles of stuff that you don't want. I've got a management system that, you know, if it's got a thousand features, I only ever wanted maybe fifty and the rest are just there and I'm paying for them and I can't get rid of them. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, like I said, sometimes you can negotiate that out. Sometimes you can't. Talked about the code issues, um, also the hardware quality issues. Again, I've dealt with one particular product set that it's just chronic. Um, so bad, I, I'm curious how there wasn't a class action lawsuit uh, regarding some of the models of this particular um, hardware set, just so buggy. Also surprised that the, you know, the company would um, allow themselves to have a culture that puts out that poor, you know, equipment and code combinations and all of that. But um, so all of that said, you know, we learned from our past lessons, you know, um, we know that there's not a great track record here. Even if we stick with this vendor, there's going to be problems. So we can build in, you know, time for dealing with that and know that we're facing that and, you know, budget man hours, you know, make sure we have the talent on on staff or know who to call when it hits because we know it's going to hit. Or we can just say, you know, okay, I've taken a look at your analytics. I've taken a look at your spectrum monitoring. I've taken a look at, you know, everything that you're offering in your super system. And I, I just don't like it. So, you know, I'm gonna instead, you know, get rid of it and do the best of breed thing. And if you take a chance on the substandard stuff and then have to replace it with the best of breed, you you bought things twice, right? So, you know, what does that do to TCO? <laughs> you know, the, the the line chart is climbing in a direction that, you know, money is going out the door. Um, and if you build on a shaky foundation, again, the design, the cabling, you know, switches, POE, whatever, uh, that's on you. Uh, you know, if you're not mindful of what you're getting yourself into and what you're layering it on top of, and you got to go back and redo things that have not been budgeted for. That's not gonna make you particularly popular with the C-suite. Uh, again, I said it's easy for any of us to forget the, you know, we, we forget things. Um, you put in all kinds of time and, 
you know, the world is getting so complicated and our systems are getting so complicated that it's it's easy to, to leave things out. Um, you know, some of this kind of overlaps with, ah, it's built into the super system. I remember that bullet point on the data sheet. So I, I must have good performance monitoring. And, you know, so maybe it's not even forgotten. Maybe you didn't give it the weight that it, you probably should have given it. And then things start to compound, you know, the, the vendor with the crappy code. And, you know, when do you most need performance monitoring? Well, when you're troubleshooting crappy code, a lot of times the assumption is you've got user problems, device problems, whatever. And the problem that you have is with the hardware itself and good performance monitoring will help you identify that. And if it's the same performance monitoring that came from the substandard code and hardware people, you know, it's probably substandard there. So, I mean, that you have to really think about how important is this thing to me and do I want to maybe put a little more time into it on the, and a little more depth into it on the RFP and um, not rely on a, a single source vendor perhaps to fill those requirements. And, and these are just some of the uh, things that fall under that that are easy to forget, you know, the notion of, and there's a bunch more. This is just, you know, kind of a representative sample uh, performance monitoring, you know, people like Seven Signal do a, a much better job than a lot of the built in stuff. You know, the notion of analytics and, you know, whether you got to do um, weird stuff for IoT devices, whether it be onboarding or, you know, separate security accommodations, whatever. And then, you know, enclosures, you got, you know, APs that are in spaces that. You knew that you knew the spaces needed APs. You forgot that maybe they need hardened enclosures because of environmental concerns or whatever. Lots of stuff that's easy to forget about. You know, different antennas and maybe everything shouldn't be an omni and a built-in because of the weird spaces. But depending on where you're coming from and how you've trained your brain from past cycles, it, it's easy to forget a lot of stuff. And that stuff that you forget again comes back and and bites you. The notion of uh, changing paradigms again, you know, we all have our own frame of reference. We all come from someplace. Um, we all have our daily duties that kind of shape how we see the world. And even when we think about evolving, you know, maybe we're, um, you know, maybe our feet are a little too deep in the mud and we're, we're not moving uh, fast enough or whatever, but. An RFP is a document and as a um, offer for people to, you know, tell me what you got that fills my needs. You know, that comes from your operational requirements and policies. Yours are not the same as, you know, even peer uh, organizations. You know, you're in you're in the business of widgets. Somebody else is in the business of widgets. Some of your operational requirements are going to be the same. Some of them aren't. They're going to be different. And it's the same in higher ed and K through 12 and manufacturing. Every site is a little bit different. Every policy is a little bit different. So you have to make sure that, you know, you are not just doing boilerplate stuff that's going to come back and bite you. You know, if I'm doing the RFP and there's stuff in the RFP that's just beyond APs, you know, I get into security uh, concerns, you know, have I talked to the, my security guy and, you know, maybe right now we're not doing 802.1X, but he's got in his mind that we need to, and therefore I haven't spec'd anything about radius and I haven't spec'd anything about a CA, a certificate authority or, or whatever. And then, you know, the RFP goes out and the stuff is bought and then, you know, 30 days later, somebody walks into my office and says, you know, we're about to unleash this other thing that you probably should have known about before you did your RFP, All right? Things change and you need to be um, very mindful that things change. And even if you're, you know, really in tune or you feel like you're in tune with what your organization needs, you do need to check around with other functional groups and just make sure that things aren't, things beyond your purview aren't percolating um, that are gonna potentially um, have to get redone after you've done an RFP. <laughs> you know, I, I've seen it a couple of times and it's kind of ugly. Oh geez, if only I had talked to so-and-so, if only that information had gotten to me. You know, a lot of times you can, um, you know, definitely 
drive up the cost of the TCO by having to rework and having to rebuy and reshape and retool uh, because of changing paradigms. Um, very easy to, excuse me, very easy to take the uh, network that you're putting a new system, a new wireless system on for granted. Cabling has always worked. You know, switches are good because we're not having problems now, right? But at the same time, you're putting the next generation of something up on the ceilings and walls that's going to be in place for five to eight years. So, you know, you, you cannot ignore your underpinnings. Every, we all have these religious debates about, well, do you need more than a gig to an AP? And do you really need POE++ plus 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 bionic Steve Austin version? You know, I could power my, um, whatever, <laughs> small nuclear reactor off of the POE and these switches. I mean, we all have religious debates about what's the sweet spot for some of the new technologies. At the same time, you got to at least think about it. You got to at least, you know, play the game. How is my cabling? How is my switching? How is my radius environment? Does it scale? Is it going to go end of life? Am I happy with the vendor? You know, if I have more POE, do I need better UPSs that give me new or that give me more, um, you know, power uh, reserve when the lights go out kind of thing? So, you know, this is, um, you know, this is the area where kind of having a holistic uh, view or the ability to remind yourself that you have to think beyond the APs and such and uh, realize that, okay, this is just part of the network and it's snapping onto the network. So I can't not think about the network because maybe you end up needing either an expanded RFP or you end up needing multiple RFPs when you realize that, you know, something is not quite um, what it should be. So kind of get to the end and I realize I, as I look at the clock, I realize I'm talking kind of fast here. I apologize for that. Jim and Kelsey know I had a COVID shot and I'm not, not quite in my right mind here. So I kind of wish I'd slowed it down a little bit, but, um, I'll slow this down because there's some important stuff here. So I say that you'll never uh, totally predict total cost of ownership of a system because there's just too many variables. But at the same time, it is so important to look back on, you know, what did I learn from the last couple of go rounds of this? And people don't, you know, people repeat history, people make the same mistakes. Some of it goes back to the vendor and blind trust in the vendor. Well, they told us it would be different this time. We, we had phone calls with their product managers and yeah, we're, we're, we're all done with all of those bugs and, and none of that's going to become a thing anymore. So we can just not, you know, plan for a thousand hours of man hours, just dealing with bugs this year. We can, we can write that right out. Okay. Fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times. I mean, at, at what point do you say, okay, you know, we know it's going to cost this many dollars to get into the new stuff, but beyond the stuff that we can easily quantify in the RFP, we got to put some effort into over the next two to five years, whatever your time frame is, what is it going to cost us to run this? We'll never get it right, but you know that that cost does not end with the RFP and what the RFP um you know, the final dollar amounts on the proposals that you get and the one that you go with. Uh, before you write the RFP, you know, the, uh, like I said, the audit, the uh, auditing of the environment. And again, it's, it goes so far beyond just the obvious bits and pieces. It's one of those things where you don't want to rush an RFP um, for a wireless system. You want to give it some thought. You want to talk to, sometimes you have stakeholders you didn't even realize you had you know, occasionally the security people ask you to do something, but it's not often enough that you even consider them a stakeholder. But then when you give it some thought, it's like, okay, well, we could do this. Do they want that? Can they benefit? Will it save them money and therefore the organization uh, more money? So, you know, expanding out the, at least the pre RFP writing dialogue um, to other people 
can be very beneficial. A lot of times too, the um, you know, none of us work in a vacuum. It's a very connected world. Um, hopefully you've got a lot of peers with a lot of background that you can lean on. You know, you can go and ask, uh, you know, hopefully um, friends from other uh, peer organizations or people you know out in the VAR world that have no um, real, um, nothing to gain by not being totally upfront and honest with you, collegial relationships where you can leverage somebody else's perspective as you write your RFP and they're very disconnected from ever making any money off of you. And, you know, hopefully those relationships, if you have them, you can leverage them to make sure that you write a good RFP that can ultimately save you some money um, and not help you to not get burned. And that's the outside input, um, you know, where have others succeeded and failed? Um, you know, what did we do right? Or what did other people do right? What did they do wrong? Um, great to have conversations. You know, if, if you can build that network of friends or if you have it or acquaintances, whatever, um, people that can talk open, maybe it's community forums or whatever, talk openly about, you know, yes, I did something similar and this is where I failed and boy, do I regret doing this. And, you know, turns out that's the same thing you're thinking about doing and gives you something to drill into before you get deeper into your own RFP. Um, I think enough said on that. Like I said, the uh, vendor input thing, you know, this is walking a fine line. You know, you, you need the vendor, the vendor needs you, vendors. Um, you know, sometimes uh, it's a, you know, love-love relationship. Sometimes it's a love-hate relationship, but you you need them, or at least you you need them to the point where you throw them over the fence and get a different one, uh, and then you need them until the you do the same thing. But, you know, their input is valuable, um, but at the same time, you got to remember that anybody you're dealing with that's, you know, the word vendor means I'm selling you stuff. Well, the more they sell you, the more money they're making. And you, you have to really um, be mindful of what the relationship is as you're proceeding through the RFP process just to not get burned. I mean, it's in there. I hate to say the auto, uh, the car dealership thing, but sometimes it doesn't feel far from it. The, I'm going to blame this one on the COVID shot, the sleaze factor, the uh, really, I, I got to buy that to accomplish that. What is that? Well, you know, that's what they tell us. We have to sell you kind of stuff. The vendor has good input. You know, you should be thinking about this. You might want to consider that. All of those helpful things, um, absolutely uh, integrate them into your thought process. Absolutely take them for the value that they give you. But at the same time, um, do not sell yourself to the vendor blindly. Okay, whatever you say I'll, I need to do, I will do. That's the bottom, the bottom line on that. And then finally, the, um, the, the big question there, what did you learn from the system that you're replacing? Assuming that you are replacing a system. Um, we're all into our, whatever it is, fifth or sixth generation of this stuff, depending on where you jumped in um, doing wireless. Probably all of us are probably somewhere at least in our third generation of doing um, refreshes and putting in new technologies. And then those of us who are older, if you didn't learn anything from past RFPs, and if you didn't learn anything about what it really costs to own a system over time, you might not be the one they want writing the RFP because there's a lot of lessons to pick up along the way and a lot of um you know recognition points of okay we got hosed pretty bad on that the last time we need to not get hosed that way this time and and you know make sure that that comes out as you're uh, preparing to go forward and with that i think we're going to end up with some time for discussion perfect so Thanks. let me introduce uh, that's sable i'll be really quick sable is a uh, approximately 200 year old pug dog and uh, we recently adopted her she um her 93 year old owner died and i have a soft spot for pugs so 
she uh, joins our other dogs and she is just the sweetest thing, but she has some interesting looks and that that's one of her, her interests. She's, she's wide awake. You wouldn't know it, but <laughs> she's walking around the backyard wide awake, but <laughs> anyhow, that's Sable. <laughs> That's cool, Lee. I think I had that look on my face after my second COVID vaccine shot. <laughs> you know, Lee, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Great presentation. A lot of positive comments coming in. Uh, you know, one of my takeaways from doing RFPs a, a, a couple times is it's just not a process of kind of coming up with a wish list of specs for access points and writing them all down and there's your RFP. Like you you talked about, you gotta um, get other stakeholders involved. Security is, is one that may have some requirements they wanna share or some goals you can help them achieve. Uh, application teams, you know, they've got requirements for the apps they're running and the apps they plan to run in the future. And that, of course, brings up, you know, network design and network planning. What is your outlook for the next four to five years on the wired side? And, um, you know, how well do your, do, will those access points fit into that design? And what yeah, are the applications absolutely. that the, the business may want to run in the next four to five years? And, and do, will the access points support those applications well. So you can't answer all those questions definitively, of course, uh, but I think you should consider them and, and talk to others about them because you might get some you know, valuable insights that, that can play into this RFP process as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the uh, just, it's easy to reduce it to organizational needs. You know, it's a, Kind of a vague um, statement, but it's like, okay, what does the organization need? <laughs> Drill into it. You know, it's not just a matter of, you know, uh, like you said, APs. You know, an AP in every other room or whatever. Okay, that that's one part of it. But what else is going on? And you know, what are our operational requirements? What are those things that day to day, if they don't function well? You know, we lose revenue, we lose customers, things don't work, people get fired. I mean, what what are our true, what goes on under the hood of each organization that truly matters? And if those things aren't at least somehow considered, you're you're asking for a lot of trouble. And, and you know, it is also challenging that a lot of us, you know kind of went through the ranks were technical people. We started off as whatever, technicians or apprentices, wherever, you know, depending on where you are, you know, you started off at the bottom, you worked your way up, you did some, you know, engineering and maybe some architecting. And often those two are the same thing, depending on where you are. But this is the, the RFP process is kind of an, an administrative function. And maybe you're not good at writing and maybe you're not good at, you know, in your mind, it all makes sense. But when you put it on paper, you don't even recognize what the hell you're thinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're just not, that's not your yeah. skill, but they turn to you because you're the the technical lead on, on wireless. And boy, if you're not comfortable doing it, you have to work with somebody who can. You have to bring that up as a, hey, I'm deficient. I can't do this. This is this is not my strong suit or strong suit. I can tell you what needs to come out of this document and i'm really good at the technical side of it but i can't communicate or verbalize or chain words together i need help there and sometimes you're asked to do it and it's and that makes it very uncomfortable you're out of your comfort zone and out of what you do typically and you know it, it is really kind of a, a tough process at times yeah, it is. And if maybe if you're in a big enough organization, there's someone in procurement or finance that, you know, does a lot of uh, RFP writing and can can help with those sort of things. But you bring up a good point. I mean, as a network engineer, we're, we don't get hung up so much on, you know, the uh, whether this word a word is shall or must or can. 
but on an RFP that can, you know, swing things uh, in a, in, you know, one way or the other uh, very significantly. So definitely good to get some, get some help on those things. We did have a, a couple of good questions and I want to invite anybody else in the audience with a question. Uh, here's one from uh, Yermund who says, uh, what about the cost of bringing your staff the needed knowledge, especially if you're changing vendors? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, if, well, I mean, just to answer the question, what about it? It's like, yeah, um, you know, good manage, good managers are going to recognize it. And we have those discussions in my own, you know, environment, you know, we're, we're contemplating going to a different vendor in the data center. How, how similar is the the new to the old? Uh, and I'm not giving away any secrets. So I'm just speaking hypothetically um, about my place of work. I'm just, you know, saying conversationally, um, hypothetically. So the new stuff, how similar is it to the old? Um, some operating systems are very much like the one you're replacing, even if it's a different vendor, like at the command line, or, you know, is this new thing, you know, totally driven or mostly driven by APIs and you've got no coders on staff and yeah, all of that stuff, you know, or, or just simple, you know, it's not a complicated system, but it is a different vendors. And, uh, you know, one of the things I, try to recommend is if you're getting into something that's new make sure that when you get into that new thing make it part of the rfp if you're going with a different vendor or for that matter a lot of times if you stay with the same vendor their new stuff feels like you're dealing with a different vendor make sure that there's training time in the rfp make sure somebody comes to your site and does some training especially if you have a lot of people you know, make just make that part of what you're looking for on the deliverables. Yeah, maybe um, uh, one more comment here, Kelsey, and I think then we can wrap up. Uh, nice comment here from Stephen. He says, I've been res responding to RFPs for 20 years. Lee has absolutely nailed it today. Excellent. So. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Lee. And I, I think, Kelsey, we can wrap it up. All right. Thank you, Jim. A huge thank you to Lee Badman. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here as always. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us and for diving into this discussion with us and, and posting your questions. We love connecting with you all every single week. So with that, um, thanks again, and we hope to see you at next week's webinar. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Thank Lee. you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.